So welcome. I am so excited that we're all here in person. We've been doing this virtually for the last couple of years, and it's not my favorite. Um, it's wonderful to, uh, to give these awards and to honor folks, um, but it's so great when we can do it in person. I think it just has a different feel. Um, this is one of my favorite Burlington Partnership for Healthy Community events. Um, this is our 13th annual Roots of Prevention celebration. Um, and my name is Mariah Flynn. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of the coalition, the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. So I hope you all were able to get some food. There'll still be plenty. We're going to leave it out because there's a few folks who are coming a little bit late, so feel free to get up and take care of yourself um, as you need to. Um, uh, hopefully you got your picture taken with our Samantha Skunk characters. Um, I'm going to have them come up for a quick second so they can take their costumes off in a moment. Um, you guys want to come on up? So thank you so much to Caroline and Lu Luana. Um, they are our amazing middle school students that are involved in our Be Above program. They are proudly wearing their costumes while the rest of us are just in our boring uh, regular clothes. Um, they are part of our Be Above group, like I said, at Edmonds Middle School. They learn about issues related to substance use and strategies that can help uh, youth in our community make healthy choices. Over time, they're in uh, their first year in Be Above right now, but over time they're going to start identifying issues they want to work on and learn skills to help them take action to support positive changes in their community. Right now they have been practicing a, practicing a skit that uses animal characters to share important lessons about tobacco prevention with younger kids. Um, they're going to be performing it for the first time for a third grade class in a few weeks, so I just want to give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Uh, this, is, this is Penny the Penguin, and this is Samantha Skunk. And Samantha is um, this beautiful magenta color when she's making healthy choices, and sometimes she makes um, unhealthy choices, and she turns green, and then her friends help her out so that she can turn <laughs> magenta again. Um, so thank you guys so much. You can take those costumes off. I know it's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> So housekeeping issues, uh, please get up and take care of yourself as you need to, like I said. Bathrooms are kind of inconvenient in this location. They're actually downstairs on the first floor. Um, the easiest way to get them is to go to them is to go out these doors, go to the left, and then there's an elevator, and you actually take the elevator down to the first floor. Um, there is a single stall bathroom here through this not an exit door off the side. Um, if anyone needs that, uh, we actually, that's my bad or our bad, we didn't understand the layout of this building well, and uh, next year I think we'll make sure that there's a better option for bathrooms, because they don't love that setup. Um, but, Luckily, we are here in person, um, and I have been uh, lucky to be the leader of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community for um, about 15 years now. And um, one of the things that always impresses me as we're putting together this event is just the passion and the commitment of so many people in our community in Burlington doing really important work to support health and wellness. Um, I recognize some of the names of people who registered, um, but not all, so since some of you are probably new to our work and here just to support the awardees, um, I thought I would just share a little bit about what we do so you can know us a little better. Um, our mission is to address the causes and consequences of substance misuse in Burlington. Um, if you were here early enough to uh, check out our slideshow, you might have seen some pictures of our work. Um, we highlighted the One Voice Youth Empowerment Program, which is the uh, program we use to support young people in middle and high school to learn skills that empowers them to be leaders around health improvement in the community. We also work on things like public education, raising awareness around support and substance use issues. Um, for instance, we have a program called Parent In for parents and caregivers of parents of tweens and teens. You can find it on social media or at parentinburlington.org. Um, and we send out tips and resources to help prevent youth use and just help kids um, make healthy choices and help us as parents um, navigate all of that too. Um, and uh, we have Jessica Leahy who will be here speaking a little bit more about that tonight. 
Um, but I think one of the most uh, impactful things that we do, or, or maybe important, is to challenging the adult behaviors and social norms that support substance misuse in our community, um, particularly when they disproportionately impact populations that have already been negatively impacted by um, inequitable systems that are targeting uh, different populations. Commercial industries need to get people using early and often to make a profit, and they often are targeting um, populations that are already disproportionately impacted by health, uh, by our health inequities. Um, so it's really important that we keep working in our community to build more, we want more protective factors than risk factors for youth if we really want to reduce substance use issues. Um, we try to bring attention to the way that all of us can be part of that, policymakers, community leaders, businesses, service providers, we can all build and support health um, through policy and practice. Um, all of us are working on different pieces of that puzzle, but the real magic, I think, is how all those pieces work together. They create an environment that supports healthy choices. Um, and the most effective way to prevent substance misuse is when the healthiest choice is the easiest choice and the most accessible to make for everybody. So Burlington is actually really, I think, blessed to have a lot of wonderful people and organizations that are working on different pieces of that puzzle. And uh, Siddiqui Sela, Dr. Kimberly Blake, and Peter Von Depp are three of those people. Um, after a really rough couple of years, um, it was just really heartwarming to read their nominations and see examples of the human capacity to be generous and creative um, and engaged in supporting others. Um, so thank you so much to this year's award winners. We're really grateful to you. There were a lot of wonderful nominations this year. Um, I wish we had capacity to recognize you all, um, to all of them, but I'll just say that these three, um, we just really appreciated the different ways in which you're connecting people, supporting the community, um, and know that you are um, in good company, that there's a lot of folks out there that are also doing great work. Thank you all. Um, um, the last, like I said, the last few years, I think for some families like my own um, and others, there was, um, was especially challenging. Um, and we learned a lot about what protective factors and community supports were in place that support people um, and provide a safety net when things get hard. Um, but what we kind of also discovered was that there were members of our community that aren't always caught by that net when they fall. Um, and so not all kids and residents had equal access to health um, and support, and they still don't. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do around that. Um, and we won't have done our job as our coalition until that work is done. But today, uh, we really want to focus on, to, to acknowledge that, but really focus on what we do have, the resiliency of the community coming out of um, the last couple years of the pandemic, how we can use all of these strengths, like our three awardees and others doing great work like that, to keep learning and as positive, um, a positive impact on the community, to keep learning and when we know better to do better um, and help us, I think that'll help us recover from the last few years and um, keep getting stronger. We've learned a lot and hopefully we can keep learning from what we've, uh, we found out. We had, um, invited a few speakers to talk a little bit in more depth about what some of that looks like um, and about sharing their experience about creating an environment and a community culture that helps people thrive, um, particularly young people. Um, Representative Taylor Small was going to speak tonight um, because they've been so deeply immersed in um, helping young people thrive. Um, unfortunately, uh, Representative Small is still in the midst of the legislative session, and so there's a lot going on, and we thought it might be a, uh, not work out, and it hasn't worked out for this evening. So they won't be here tonight, but I just want to kind of acknowledge them um, and the work that they've done. The stress, to, in particular, stress for individuals who do not feel included, valued, or feel discriminated against can really impact their health and wellness. And um, Taylor Small has been uh, really wonderful in advocating for folks, particularly um, 
around disparities around mental health and substance use outcomes for queer and transgender youth in Burlington and in our larger community. So I want to make sure that we acknowledge that work and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to have them at a future uh, celebration. Um, but I am excited to introduce our first speaker for the evening, our keynote. Uh, we've invited Jessica Leahy here. Um, Jessica is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure, How to the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed, um, and also her newer book, The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that because we are, are doing an event with her where she's going to get in more in depth, so if you like what you hear tonight, please come out again, and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, I have been reading... Uh, her most recent book and it's basically an outline of a lot of the strategies that we're doing in our community the BPHC is working on so I'm really obsessed um, if you are not as obsessed with reading about prevention data and research as I am um, you, she has also been walking through her book in short video clips on Instagram when I'm an absolute fan girl so I've been uh, watching those and I think they're great and I'd highly recommend for anyone who wants to get a little taste um, she makes the info really accessible. Um, over 20 years, I think some of that comes because she has such an experience with teaching. So she's taught every grade from 6th to 12th in both public and private schools. She spent five years teaching in a drug and alcohol rehab for adolescents in Vermont. Um, and she serves as a prevention and recovery coach at a medical detox and recovery center in Stowe. Uh, she has written about education and parenting and child and uh, Children and Health um, for the Washington Post and the Atlantic and has ha had a bi-weekly column in the New York Times for three years called the Parent-Teacher Conference, um, which was great. I read some of those articles as well. So she uh, also designed and wrote the educational curriculum for Amazon Kids award-winning animated series that is my niece and nephew's favorite show, The Stinky and Dirty Show. Um, and she has... Um, also co-hosts a podcast called Hashtag Am Writing um, from her home here in Vermont. So I'm very excited to have her. Thank you so much for coming, Jessica, and for sharing a little bit about what you know. No worries. Um, during the pandemic, I had the wonderful delight to find out that my husband's name was on a bunch of posters that called him a, um, a COVID paid liar. Dr. Tim Leahy paid liar during COVID, so that was fun. Um, but my daughter uh, went to uh, CVU and felt incredibly supported. The pandemic was a very strange time for her to go to school, um, but it also I'm so grateful we were here because my daughter is also trans. And so she, you know, was fairly restricted in her college search as things against uh, that are sort of coming up right now, um, anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ plus kids sentiments. And so she is very happy that sh to stay in Vermont in order to be in a place where she could be supported. I feel so grateful that we live in a place where she can be supported. In fact, I get emails all the time from people. I got one yesterday from someone saying, hey, we're moving back home from Norway, um, but we can't move just anywhere because we have a trans kid. And so do you feel safe? Does your child feel safe and supported? And I was so proud to be able to say, yes, absolutely. Burlington is a dream place to live where that is concerned. But the past 36 hours have been really um, 
the timing of this is incredible for me because I found out yesterday that one of my daughter's classmates at Bennington died by suicide. Um, the, uh, the press release just went out on that just as I was walking in the door. And, oh, thank you. And, um, and I also found out that some of you, if you have ever read um, work by a, bloggy, a blogger, a mommy blogger named Deuce, Heather B. Armstrong, she died by suicide today. So I'm feeling like this is such an important moment to be talking about prevention, to be talking about supporting our kids who are especially, who are disproportionately either underserved, underrecognized, or, um, or not getting the, um, not being recognized as humans. <laughs> so anyway, my work in substance use prevention began with the fact that I myself am an alcoholic. I will have 10 years of recovery in about three weeks. Keeping my fingers crossed. Thank you. So the, as soon as I got my own sobriety sort of in a place where I felt like I had some sort of control over the world and my life and I, was, I felt like uh, I wasn't going insane anymore, um, my first thought was, okay, well, if I'm the child of an alcoholic and my husband is the child of someone with substance use disorder, and by the way, my, one of my parents was the child of a sub, someone with substance use disorder and they were the child of someone with substance use disorder and so on and so on and so on, how do I make this stop with me? Like, how on earth do I make myself be the end point for this long line of substance use disorder throughout my family? And I realized I knew so little about what that meant. Um, uh, luckily, I'm a journalist and a big dork, and so I love the research. I love that part of it. So I spent a year researching um, what eventually became the addiction inoculation, a year just before I could even write the proposal for the book, because this is such a complicated field. And um, so essentially that book became sort of what I needed as a parent and as an educator. Um, some of you may have heard, by the way, in the introduction that I worked for, um, as, for five years as a teacher to adolescents in an inpatient substance use disorder rehab for adolescents. And you, some of you may have been like, what are you talking about? That doesn't exist. And you are absolutely correct because they closed their doors to adolescents. This was Valley Vista over on the other side of the state. Um, so that does not exist anymore. And so, but I did spend a lot of time looking at my students and saying, how did you end up here? And what could we as educators have done differently in order to make it so that you never had to land in this position? So this was a very personal topic for me. And so I got to spend a couple of years essentially coming at the research just as objectively as possible. I looked at everything from the genetics to does it help if you have pets? You know, like all of the things that may or may not have an impact on your risk for substance use disorder. One of the things that has been really fun for me is finding ways to explain to people um, things that they may not want to hear about. It's really difficult to get people to listen to content around substance use disorder. It really scares people. And so in, at its very essence, I think my job is, it's one of the coolest jobs in the world because I get to get curious about something and then do a lot of research and then translate it and teach it to other people. But I also have to help people hear things that they may not necessarily want to hear. And so in the short time I have this evening, I wanted to share with you something that has been really, really difficult for people to hear and why it is the perfect example of why we need to be doing what so many of the people in this room are doing. As was mentioned, I do a daily 90-second video on Instagram and TikTok and all the places about preventing substance use in kids, and it's a little digestible chunk. And, you know, I get comments back, and of course it's the internet, so there are always horrible people, but there are more, more than that, there are just really lovely people who say, wow, I didn't know that. Thank you for that information. I'm going to do, you know, better moving forward with that information. And the biggest pushback I get is on the topic of sipping at home, of people who just want to raise their children like those European children, the children that can have sips so that when the alcohol is available around them, they don't freak out and go nuts and just don't know how to moderate their thinking. So if we can just raise our kids like those European children, it's all gonna be great. And so I have to disabuse them. I have to do a little myth busting for them and explain that, you know, well, 
problem is, is that we can't teach moderation to people who can't learn moderation. I am never going to be able to moderate my drinking. That's not so much a thing for me. And we know that parents that have consistent and clear messaging around, no, not until, sometimes they say it's legal, but that's kind of a like, just because kind of reason. So adolescents don't tend to go for those just because reasons very uh, very well. So I tend to go with the no, not until your brain is done developing. We know that parents that have a consistent and clear message of no, not until your brain is done developing um, sh should you have any drugs or alcohol. And parents who have a permissive stance on drugs and alcohol have kids that have much higher levels of substance use disorder during their lifetime or much higher incidence of substance use disorder during their lifetime. And people get very, very angry about the idea that I'm busting the European myth because they're like, no, 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 that's a, that's a thing. That is absolutely a thing. And I say, well, here's the problem. A, you can't teach moderation in that way, and B, uh, you know, it's really important that the message is delay, 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 because the younger a child is when they first try um, addictive substances like drugs or alcohol, that the, um, the higher their lifelong risk for substance use disorder is. If you first try alcohol when you're in eighth grade, for example, you're creeping up near a 50% chance of, having, of developing substance use disorder over your lifetime, whereas if we can get to 10th grade, it goes down by about half. And if if we can get to 12th grade, it goes down to somewhere around what it is in the general population, that 10 to 11 percent. And so if the message is delay, 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 and we're being permissive and therefore letting kids have drugs and alcohol in our home and letting them have sips, then we're possibly not giving them the most consistent and clear messages around um, delaying until their brains are done developing. And then I have to pull out the data on substance use in Europe. And I have to explain to them that, well, according to the European Union, uh, sorry, excuse, excuse me, according to the World Health Organization, the European Union and the European region as a whole has the highest rates of alcohol consumption in the entire world and the highest rates of illness and death attributable to alcohol consumption in the world. And then people get even angrier and they say, no, but what about? I have an exception. What about uh, Greece? What about Italy? What about this? What about that? And so actually when I first made these videos, I ended up having to make six follow-up videos with very specific data from the World Health Organization. And what's interesting about the follow-up uh, videos to that initial video doing the myth busting around the sort of European sipping at home moderation myth is this. There are exceptions to that myth to the whole, and there are exceptions, sorry, to the uh, rates of alcohol consumption in the European Union. But what's fascinating about those exceptions is that they occur because the community standards are such that it is not a thing, it's not approved of, it's not looked well at for you to be heavily intoxicated, especially in public. Which drives home the point that we have the ability to create community standards in our own communities that are based on actual information, real clear information, and not our sort of magical thinking, cross our fingers, hope it goes well kind of, kind of quote, information. And the countries in the European Union, or European Union that do have lower levels of alcohol consumption, as I mentioned, it is due to the fact that their community standards are such that it is just not approved of. So what's so cool about that is we can, we can create our own communities and our families. We can create our own communities in our schools and in our, in our communities and in our villages. I happen to live in a very small village before I moved here in New Hampshire where we all kind of came together and we decided we were gonna watch out for each other and we were going to create our own uniform community standard about drinking um, among the kids in our little village. And that became our own community standard. And what's fascinating about community standards is that it actually drives consumption. Where alcohol and drugs are concerned, perception drives reality. We have this unfortunate glitch in our makeup um, as humans that um, called uh, pluralistic ignorance, where we tend to overestimate where alcohol is concerned, for example, 
Um, we tend to overestimate people's interest in, uh, in having alcohol around, in you know, having alcohol available at an event. We also tend to overestimate other people's drinking, how much other people drink. And so if you were to give kids real, true information about how many people are out there drinking and how much they actually drink, as opposed to their faulty perception, by the way, these studies on this were done at Princeton University because they were having a real problem there. They found out that at their um, alumni reunion, so much alcohol was consumed that it was, in terms of a gathering, second only to the Indianapolis 500. Princeton reunions, the Indianapolis 500. So Princeton University decided that they were going to tackle this in such an effective way, and yes, that's sarcasm in my voice. They were going to ban kegs that is gonna solve the problem. And so they had this incredible opportunity to do surveys of the way people felt about the banning of kegs. And it turns out that when you ask student Princeton students about how they felt about kegs being banned, they said, well, I don't care so much, but everyone else cares a lot. And also when they surveyed them on how much they thought their roommate, their friend, their hallmates drank, they tended to overestimate that. And that's really important to know because if you overestimate how much other people are drinking, it can affect how much everyone drinks in, as a consequence. So for example, if you, and it turns out that there are some slight gender differences to here too, and as with all things having to do with gender differences, this is a gross generalization. But if you are male and you believe that everyone else drinks more than you, and especially if you believe that someone you look up to drinks more than you, you are going to be very likely to raise your level of drinking to what you believe the norm to be, even if it's false, even if you have overestimated it. And if you are a female and you believe that other people drink more than you, um, and if especially if you don't want to drink, what you're more likely to do is to withdraw socially, which is not a good thing either. So we have the power to give kids good, true, real, credible information in order to create realities that are not based on myths, not based on magical thinking, not based on false perceptions of social norms, but based on actual data around how many people drink. Many of them end up, by the way, coming as a real surprise to kids. You know, there's the whole, you know, for example, if your eighth grader were to be approached by another eighth grader, and they say, here, you want a beer? And your eighth grader's like, no, that's okay. And the other kid says, oh, it's no big deal. Everybody does it, everybody drinks. But your eighth grader knows, well, hold on, that's not true. Only 24.7% of eighth graders uh, admit that they've had more than a sip of alcohol by the end of eighth grade. And they, they don't have to say it, but if they have that information in the back of their head, and they know, by the way, because they have been taught about how their brains work and how the adolescent brain is a very different brain from a fully developed adult brain, that it is a big deal. That drugs and alcohol do a lot more damage in the adolescent brain than they do in an adult brain. Then your kid, that eighth grader, can make much better decisions than a kid who's, you know, sort of operating on all of the misperceptions and magical thinking. So by giving kids really good information that's solid, incredible, and up to date, and by helping kids understand that they are not adults, that their brains are not done developing, that drugs and alcohol do a lot more damage in their brain um, and get into the, some of the nitty gritty details of that. By empowering kids, by giving them, helping them feel like they have a really good sense of self-efficacy, that if they make a decision that they can actually stick to it and affect change and make their life a better place. And when we teach them to self-advocate and to protect their bodily autonomy and protect themselves and their friends, those kids are gonna go on to have much lower lifelong levels of substance use disorder. Because those kids have had some of the best known preventions that we have heaped on top of them. A feeling, fostering that feeling of self-efficacy, real true information, role models, people that help, help set community standards, healthy community standards. Um, that's the kind of education that we need to be giving kids. And you all are helping do that. You're helping create community standards so that kids can grow up in a place where they're maybe not operating on misperceptions, they're operating on real community standards that are, that are actually about data and not about hopes and wishes and dreams and 
unicorns and butterflies and rainbows. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to be here this evening, and I apologize for being so scattered, but my, as I mentioned, it's been a really, really difficult 36 hours, and luckily um, my daughter is actually coming home from Bennington so that she can be back in our fold this weekend, so I'm like waiting for my little chicks to get back in the nest so that I can give her a big hug and tell her how much I love her and, and, um, and protect her and you know let her know that we love her for who she is and not who we wish she was and that we don't just love her based on her performance and that we will be there for her no matter what. And that's all we can really hope for um, with our own kids. So thank you very, very much for the work that you do. It is so important. I'm so, so grateful to be a part of this community, um, not just for, about, for myself, but for my children and for all the children that uh, live here. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Jessica. I know you have a lot going on. I really appreciate you coming here and being with us tonight. Um, and for all of your words of wisdom around substance use prevention. Um, if you want to catch more of uh, Jessica Leahy, we have two upcoming events with her. She'll be presenting at Hunt Middle School on Tuesday, May 23rd at 7 p.m. and at CVU High School um, on May 25th at 7 p.m. So, um, if, you, if you're afraid you might forget those dates, um, everyone who come, who's registered for this event will likely get a follow-up email with more information about that. Um, and we also have um, some posters in the back that you're welcome to take uh, too. So we're gonna take a quick break in a minute so we can stretch and connect again before we continue with a story from Farine Paris Meyer um, and then some uh, awards. Um, there is, there should be now coming out uh, some coffee and tea and an assortment of desserts on the table. Um, before you take a break though and leave your tables, can you do one thing for me? Um, talk to the people at your table and find out who has the closest birthday. Um, either that just passed or that's coming up. And we'll need that information later, okay? All right, have a nice break, 15 minutes. I hope you had a chance to get some food and to chit chat a little bit. Maybe connect with some of the awardees. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker who's gonna bring us into the next phase of tonight. Um, some of you may know uh, as a resident and a mother in the Burlington community, she creates heartfelt spaces for connection and learning through the art of storytelling. Um, she has done that and created stages at the Flynn, in schools, in the park, wherever there's community. Um, she was recently nominated for an Emmy for Homegoings, an interview with Myra Flynn. So I'm very excited to have her here today and to tell a story for all of us. Thank you. Oh. And her name, oh my gosh, is <laughs> Farine Paris Meyer. Thank you so much, Farine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mariah. A round of applause to all the labor of love that goes into this event to celebrate um, our community. So just a shout out for that. Awesome. Well, hello, hello, hello. My name is Fareen Paris Meyer. I use she, her pronouns. And as Mariah shared, um, my gift that I do in this community and beyond is storytelling. And I think for me to be here today, living, breathing, I find myself reflecting on this quote. We have two lives, and the second one begins when we realize we only have one. And I remember, I mean like, I'm, I'm gonna let us breathe that in. We have two lives, and the second one begins when we realize we only have one. So first and foremost, as an artist, as a storyteller, I am here to invite us to slow down 
and to be in this given moment. I am not saying that what is holding and waiting on our hearts uh, goes out the window, goes out the door. I think too often we make people pause the things that they're holding. That's why I loved how Jessica, naming for us, I'm here, but also my heart is here. And I think that is deeply important. So for me, um, as a black woman, uh, as a mother, as an educator, as, as a queer soul, um, those are some of the lived experiences that are influencing my narrative when we speak about this topic. And for me, just before I start, storytelling is beautiful. We have to remember that it is our oldest way of passing down our narrative. Uh, this concept of oral storytelling, at least, right? And when I think about all of us, we are all um, here with ancestors. You know, as Maya Angelou says, I stand here as one, um, but there's 10,000 ancestors behind me, and, and that is something I am constantly telling myself because, wow, this thing called life can be really incredibly hard to do. Because if it isn't the kids or the work or something else, it's systems, it's racism, it's homophobia, there are so many things flipping us backwards and forwards when we're trying so hard to simply do this beautiful life and I am so grateful that I could be here today because I found this opportunity as an invitation to go back in time and reflect on how substances has played in my life. And so I wanna start with, I'm Haitian. Um, I am a proud um, Haitian uh, Afro-Caribbean. My parents immigrated to this country, I'm 41, so 42 years ago. And growing up in Haitian culture, I think about the house parties that my, my dad used to be a DJ personality in the Boston area for the Haitian community. And so we used to have gatherings at the house. And in our culture, whether you are the 89 grandmother or you're the three-year-old child, it is a multi-generational space. And all of it exists loud and lots of just beautiful chaos and vibrancy. But growing up, this concept of abusive with substances, I didn't see it in my particular home or space. You know, in the Haitian culture, I feel like there's so much that they're trying to wrap their head around that this concept of uh, all of these substances were a pause. And I felt like I had a positive, actually, experience and an understanding of what it means uh, to be around different substances. But then I went to college. I went to college, and as a first generation um, daughter of immigrants, I grew up in a very strict household because education was my passport to the future, and I dare not do anything to interrupt this path that my parents had for me. So I think that, and with uh, high level expectations one can put on a youth, when I went off to college, it was like freedom, right? And what I realized is because no one took the time to have those heart-to-heart -heart open conversations, it was just like, don't talk about it. But we can't do that because not talking about it does nothing when I'm in the position of something being presented to me. We have to talk about these things, right? Like We have to talk about white supremacy. We have to talk about anti-blackness. We have to talk about mental health. We have to talk about the fact that our community is numbing so many feelings because we don't have compassion and vulnerability sometimes to give people space to just be and exist as they are. So when I went off to college immersed in this community, somehow, this idea of the best four years is laced with a single story that you must, ha you have to drink or do said things in order to fully experience the fun. And unfortunately, even though growing up in a Haitian household where there was balance around all of these different things, being immersed in an environment, it was stronger than the will that I had as a 17 year old girl. And I'm naming that because I, Farin Paris Meyer, was one of those college students that ended up getting transported for alcohol. And I haven't said that out loud uh, since I was in college, right? It's actually something that, you know something my, like my partner doesn't even know because I try so hard to like, that's not me anymore, but I think it's so important. 
I can't stand up here and act like I run a business and I do all these things and I'm Emmy nominated without being honest about just the struggles and the skeletons that exist in all of us. And so for me, this idea of needing this liquid to give myself a peace of mind to exist, what I really didn't realize was happening in that moment is that I was a black girl immersed in a predominantly white environment. And even though I came from another school that was predominantly white, but my city was like filled with brown and black folks, being immersed in, in a situation where you don't see yourself represented, you start to figure out how to either like numb the thoughts or figure out how to just do the dance that everyone is telling you to do. And I think it's something that we don't talk about. Because when I'm thinking about my kids that I'm raising, I'm thinking about the work that I've been doing in the Burlington School District, or even just talking with adults, we are not pausing enough for us to unpack what is on our souls. We are not unpacking enough that even though life can be hard and sometimes I make choices I might not agree with, where is the compassion to let me know that that does not define me? So that I don't keep going down this path of either shame or like I'm not good enough. And I think for me at the age of 40, um, I started doing profound work around my younger self. Hey, Fareen, what would you tell your 17-year-old self? What would you tell your six-year-old self? And I find myself through this storytelling able to go back in time and say, guess what, Fareen? Um, you were able to manage going through the pandemic and not finding uh, uh, nights where you allowed alcohol or drugs to take over because you were so desperately scared about what was to come. Like, I don't know about you, everything got canceled, friends, school, and I'm just like, what is this life? And the loneliness kicks in, the isolation kicks in. And I remember a lot of my friends um, in my different circles you know, it's like, oh, what do we do today? Like, let's hang out and drink. Oh, what do we do tomorrow? Like, let's hang out. You don't even notice it. And all of a sudden, you're like, when did I become this person that was doing a little sip, sip? Like, that sip, sip culture can be dangerous, especially if you don't have at least the honesty to have a conversation with yourself. Forget what I need to tell my partner and my kids. I, Farine Paris Meyer, if I'm not being honest with where my struggles or tribulations might be, then I'm gonna be the one that suffers the most. And the thing that came to me during the pandemic where I saw such a spike in people really turning into to substances, I remembered a student that I met when I used to work in higher ed. I did 15 years working in higher education and so for me, even though as a college student, I sometimes had my struggles, what I got to do was pay it forward and become a higher ed professional. And I was the person who could approach students with a very human touch. There is no shame. What happened today, this weekend? Oh, you were like caught in this particular incident. I'm not here trying to judge you. That does not define you. But let's talk about the why behind it. And then let's talk about, is this the kind of legacy or energy that you're trying to have while you're at this institution? Because we're gonna make good choices, we're gonna make bad choices, but I'm hoping that we can at least align in more choices that help you not just survive this college thing, but thrive. And I remember this student, David, and I remember David because when his family moved him into college, his parents were some of the most joyful people I had met. I was that position at a college where you live in the residence halls with the, kid, with the students, so I saw a lot. <laughs> and I remember David's family. And then fast forward uh, two years later, I'm at this retreat. And at this retreat, I'm using the power of storytelling to get to know who my student leaders are beyond this role of being an orientation leader because I know that they're siblings, they're brothers, they're partners, they're cousins. And we created this space where students were allowed to share parts of their stories that they thought was important for our collective group to know so that we could witness them, so that we can see them, so that we could create space for them to matter. Until this day, I met David um, back in 2006. Until this day, that student story has stayed with me. Because when we were taking a moment to share different parts of ourselves, and you had students either you know, coming out the closet, students talking about medication with mental illness, David shared a story that took our whole room by surprise. And he invited us 
to stop putting his dad on a pedestal. Because what we didn't know is behind the scenes, his dad was a hardcore alcoholic. And though there was the joy that we saw and when he'd visit to campus and the packages and all of that, back home was a different parent. And I remember this 19-year-old white man finally having space to just cry, be real, and not act like his family and house life was perfect. It didn't matter if this student just shared this beautiful story of like, I'm so... That should not stop someone from being able to move forward with their truth. I love that maybe your hardest moment has been this, but it shouldn't stop me from saying what my hard moment is because I'm afraid of what that could look like. But David Werner is someone who I want to say has helped be my North Star when it comes to my kids because I remember the narratives that he shared. And I remember him talking about the, the frozen bottles in the freezer and talking about like when I just need, when I just need my dad. Yes, he comes to the games, he does this, but man, the nights that are really bad, all I wanted was my dad. And so I feel like with the pandemic where I saw a lot of people start to spiral, I continued to echo David's story in my head. And that is what I do. And I think this is a reminder, especially for our youth, you are so unbelievably powerful. Too often we as adults keep acting like you haven't lived already and that you don't have a powerful narrative to share. But if you were to talk to me at 6, 8, 13, I could have shared a lot of things with you that I was picking up because we see and feel so much. And so when we can empower our youth to speak and live out loud, it's not just an impact in a, in a development for them they have the opportunity to truly shift behaviors and patterns with us adults in this society. Because I really feel this younger generation is gonna be the one that is going to save us from like the lack of compassion and so many things that exist that get in the way of us seeing each other's humanity. So for David and for the youth that have the courageous to have conversations with people, I love that my kids will ask me, is, is, what, what number is that? And I'm like, it's my first, that should be okay, because you should be allowed to ensure that I'm living my life the way that I want to, the same way I'm gonna check in on you that, you know, three meals of just mac and cheese, like that might not be the most like, right? It goes back and forth. There's no age or status in this. You're human, I'm human. We're doing this thing called life. It can be really difficult. Let's have open conversations of what's getting in the way. Let's have open conversations of what we seem to be leaning into to deal with that and then assess, is this in alignment with my ability to truly make the most of the second life we have? when we realize it's this moment. I could put my head down tonight and not wake up tomorrow, but I'm deeply proud that I can move through this community with honesty and creating spaces where we use the power of human stories to have a human moment. We all have stories that are worthy of sharing, and I feel this could be a beautiful medicine in us taking agency over what is, what isn't, what is the reality, what isn't the reality, because there is nothing like someone affirming or saying something you're like, me too, and not questioning the hardness that exists or not questioning the impact that people's behaviors are having. It doesn't matter what your intention is. Impact is impact. And so I think y'all for inviting me to be here. I thank David for being so brave in that space because for me, when I worked at a college, all these students were helping me form my idea of how I would be a mom. And so there are a bunch of things. I have kitchen dance parties because a student told me that's how you get chores. And you know, and that's Molly, right? And there are so many different things that storm in my heart. So that's the other piece. When people gift you your story, honor it by reflecting on it. Right, like this program will conclude after we celebrate our honorees. And I really hope that what was shared in this space haunts you, but in a good way, because we need to keep coming back and reflecting on these things. So without further ado, I will pass it back over to Mariah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freen. Thank you for sharing your story with us and for being here tonight and for being a part of this community and make, creating community through story. Um, before the break, we focused a lot on our work 
um, and issues related to our mission of uh, preventing substance use. But now I want to focus on all the people and the organizations doing work in Burlington that are supporting a thriving community and making our work easier. Um, so each year, like I said, we receive nominations for uh, folks doing work in Burlington, usually without a lot of recognition, just because they're doing it just because it's needed. Um, and maybe that's where their passion is. Um, I think our real success in having a healthy Burlington that prevents substance misuse and just in general helps create a thriving community is to enhance those things in the community that are our strengths and our positive influences. There are people in the community uh, like our awardees that are creating a layer of protection that helps create connection and reduces substance use issues. Um, so one reason that we hold this celebration every year is to take is to have a chance to take a moment and acknowledge our community strengths. Um, there's been a lot to I, we've all kind of alluded to some of the challenges of the last few years, but there's a lot that we're also doing right and that are um, that are real successes in our community and we need to acknowledge them so that we can keep doing it and keep building on them. So Siddiqui and Kimberly and Peter were all nominated by others in the community because people saw them as examples of Burlington strengths. Um, sometimes like Siddiqui, they're meeting individually with young people, helping to build connection and resiliency. Um, sometimes, like Peter, they're building new, more accessible opportunities that over time will benefit future generations of children and families. Um, and then there's people like Dr. Blake who have used her, who's used her personal experience and her professional experience and, that, and the power that comes with that to bring attention to important community issues. Um, thank you so much for all that all three of you have done for our um, for our community here in Burlington and beyond. So I just wanted to thank So I hope you had a chance. We tried to reduce our uh, paper impact this year and have a virtual program. I hope that there, that still created accessibility for folks to be able to um, go to that link and, and read a little bit more about the awardees. We also have in there our theme, why we call this the Roots of Prevention Award Celebration, um, because the, every year our awardees are helping to plant little prevention seedlings in our community. Each of them is, uh, we think of like an individual tree that's supporting all the limbs and the leaves and the people and the, um, and the organizations that they're connected to. Um, if we're all doing that, there are more trees that are supporting healthy individuals and policies and practices in the community. The gaps between all of us start to grow smaller and together we create a forest. And that forest is stronger than any one individual tree and we can provide an environment in which people can thrive and flourish. Um, so I just wanna say again, thank you to those awardees that are uh, helping us build those roots for prevention in Burlington. I'm going to invite um, Flynn Elementary School Principal Nikki Ellis to come up and speak about Siddiqui Sella um, for the Outstanding Individual Award. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Nikki Ellis, and I am the principal of Flint Elementary School here in Burlington. It's my first year in that role, um, and I'm really excited to be here with you tonight um, to celebrate Siddiqui Sela uh, and all of the work that he has brought to Flint Elementary. In my first year there, he has guided much of my work and the principles that I apply to how I interact with kids. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we connected and what Siddiqui's work has looked like at Flynn Elementary School, what my personal connection to that experience is, and how Siddiqui has embodied uh, the power, joy, and love of Burlington youth, um, which, as Freen pointed out, exists within every one of the youth that we interact with and lives with them at age four, five, 12, 18. Um, and so 
when I came to Flynn this year and started to connect with students, um, I was acutely aware that the students of Flynn are very diverse and have many different identities and experiences, and there are some of those experiences that I can't begin to understand because I am white and have white privilege. Uh, and so when I started to talk to the students in fifth grade and one boy turned to me and said, it would be really nice to connect with someone who shares an experience with me as a black man and a black boy, and I wish that I had that at Flynn. Uh, I knew that my work was to figure out where that connection could come from and then to get out of the way uh, because there was going to be power and joy and love in that mentorship. Uh, so I went about reaching out to the high school, to the assistant principals there, and just said, hey, uh, I'm looking to find um, a black man who is in the upper grades at BHS who may want to mentor a younger student. Um, and that's how I was connected to Siddiqui, uh, who also went to Flynn Elementary School long ago, whose siblings all went to Flynn Elementary, um, and who is really well known in the neighborhood around Flynn. So uh, Siddiqui showed up the first day and everyone remembered and recognized him. It was a celebrity who walked in the doors. Uh, and it was like time stopped because uh, all of the students saw this person who they had not seen before in the school and suddenly there was a connection to some of their own lived experiences uh, with race and the experience of not seeing teachers or adults who look like them in Burlington schools, which is something that we need to continue to commit to changing. Uh, and I felt deeply connected to that experience that Siddiqui brought to the school as well, because as a transgender youth, I did not uh, see anyone who looked like me in the community either. Uh, and much of my own mental health struggles with suicidal ideation and substance use would have been avoided if I had had that mentorship in my community. And so we know that middle school is a time when youths begin to reconcile some of those experiences with marginalization, such as racism, ableism, transphobia, homophobia. And so it's important to me as the principal of Flynn that we're making those connections proactively, restoratively, and as early as possible. Uh, and so Siddiqui's work at Flynn really embodies the five values that we co-constructed as a Flynn community, which are joy, friendship, growth, curiosity, and accountability. Uh, and Siddiqui is the most consistent person I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, I often think of his wisdom patience, calmness, kindness, and empathy with students, and I try to live that in my work too. Uh, and I knew that I had fallen in love with Siddiqui when he chose to stay at school for a third through fifth grade play, uh, which if you have ever been to one of those, you, you really can't understand a ton of what's being said, but you're like nodding along and really trying to like follow. Um, and this high school boy stayed for the entire two hour play. <laughs> and I knew at that moment that this was, this was someone who cared very deeply about the student they were mentoring uh, because that student had a fleeting one second part in that play. Um, and Siddiqui committed and stayed for that experience. Um, and so again, I just wanna say thank you Siddiqui for bringing that power, joy, and love to Flynn Elementary. Uh, you've helped to start clearing a path so that we can continue to do that work. Uh, and your influence has been powerful to students, but it has been powerful to the adults as well. So please join me in thanking and congratulating Siddiqui Sela uh, for all of his work in the Flynn school community.
Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, so now I would love to invite uh, Grace Keller up to speak about Dr. Kimberly Blake, who is receiving our Youth and Families Award. Thank you, Mariah. I'm Grace Keller. Um, I'm here to present about Kimberly Blake. Um, demonstrate radical generosity. When I first started in harm reduction, one of the heroes, one of my heroes said this in the speech, and it stuck with me. When I thought of what I would say about Kim tonight, it is the first thing that came to mind. Demonstrate radical generosity. Kim's prevention efforts are broad, deep, and sincere. From the individual and direct service and treatment, to babies in utero, to other parents and loved ones, to the community with rallies and awareness events, and to the state and federal government with laws and holding drug companies accountable. There were no low barrier treatment in Vermont before Kim Blake. As a person working at the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program, the harm reduction and syringe exchange program for over 10 years, I saw so many people who the treatment system did not apply to. Many had tried so many times. Some had been kicked out for behavioral issues. Some had been permanently banned. Some had never attempted because of mental health or other barriers that were insurmountable to them. At Safe Recovery, we saw these individuals languish and suffer, oftentimes asking or begging for help. We knew that while they may have had issues in other settings, we had successfully and happily served them for years. So we decided it was time to offer buprenorphine treatment in-house on demand. This does not seem so radical, um, now, but at the time, people were shocked. I had doctors and physicians warn me that it would never work, told me it would be dangerous, and people even called my supervisor to complain. What these doctors didn't do was apply for the job. My biggest concern was who would be the provider. We need somebody who would be, take the risk, was, would support people through their process, even if that meant drug use, would be non-judgmental believed in harm, and believed in harm reduction. We needed someone that people felt comfortable being honest with. We really needed a unicorn. Six weeks in, in with no applications, a little number one came into my kiosk, um, and there was an applicant. Who could this be? I took a deep breath and clicked. Kimberly Blake, no way. I can't, I can't explain the relief I felt. I knew who she was as I'd heard of her for years, as I feel like she's delivered half of Vermont's babies. <laughs> I also knew her to be a mother who just months earlier lost her beautiful son, Sean, to, to an overdose. Demonstrate radical generosity. She was stepping forward when everybody else stepped back, when no one would have blamed her for not stepping forward. Most importantly, she was the right person. She understood that treatment isn't an all or nothing thing, that retention is in the relationships you build, and that truly empowering people is recognizing any positive change. When we look at things in an all or nothing abstinence or chaotic drug use lens, we miss a menu of options that keep people safe, that are primary prevention, and that are big accomplishments for people. Kim celebrated all of, that with, all of this with people. Demonstrate radical generosity. Kim is a pioneer in so many ways. She's one of the first pe people to treat women with, to treat pregnant women with buprenorphine in an office setting in Vermont. She also recognized the importance of prioritizing, treating, and supporting fathers. She recognized that the best prevention for children is keeping their parents alive and keeping families together. She was also the, she's also the first person to step up and organize a rally or an awareness event. She's the first to testify. In fact, I watched a House committee panic and not have someone to testify um, on a certain side of things this, this session and called her and on the spot, she jumped onto Zoom and testified. Um, first to dress, directly ask, uh, address the Sacklers and other drug companies in victim impact statements. And she's literally the first person to comfort parents when they lose a child to overdose. The hospital actually has her cell phone. Oh, and when she's not doing all of this, she's delivering babies. <laughs> Kim's multiple roles in prevention embody, embody radical generosity, generosity of time, generosity of expertise, generosity of compassion, generosity of love, generosity of breaking down barriers, and generosity of taking risks. 
This is why there's no better person to be the Youth and Families Award, to, be, to get the Youth and Families Award, my friend Kimberly Blake. <clears throat> so our third award is our DG Weaver Award. Um, the Burlington Partnership is proud to have this award where we honor the late principal of Burlington High School, DG Weaver, vice principal, I'm sorry. Um, we give this annual award to a person associated with the Burlington schools who, like Mr. Weaver, is a positive role model and who goes above and beyond to support healthy opportunities and activities for our youth, either as a staff or a volunteer or community member. I never met DG, but when we started organizing this celebration 13 years ago, um, community members talked about his dedication to supporting the kids in the district and creating healthy opportunities. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of that conversation focused around sports and, uh, and exercise and that being a really important thing for DG. So I'm really excited about who, who's receiving this award today. We're so grateful to his, uh, DG's family for allowing us to honor his memory in this way. Um, I'd love to invite uh, Carl Crawford and Sadie Harris to come up and speak upon, uh, about Peter Von Depp, who is receiving the DG Weaver Award. Hello, uh, my name is Carl Crawford, and I've known Peter Von Depp for almost 18 years of my life. Uh, I do not remember the first time where I played frisbee with him, but as soon as it started, it just happened to just be an occurrence in my life. Uh, I've met some of my best friends through frisbee, fostered the best relationships, just playing on the Edmonds Middle School field, playing at Callahan. Peter calling me up and asked me if I wanted to play against the old men team that was going to go to nationals. Uh, <laughs> Peter giving me rise to Winter League. Peter telling me that that guy used to play for the best Boston men's team. Peter just, like, whether he knew it or not, just really just, like, giving me this love for this game that has just really continued far onto my life, like, farther than I ever thought it could be. When I first started playing Frisbee, I ran across country, and now I don't run across country anymore, and I just play Frisbee. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's worked out way better for me than it... <laughs> Uh, currently, I, uh, I attend the University of Vermont, and um, we're competing for a national championship. And uh, of the members on that team, I believe uh, like five of them I used to play on Edmonds with Peter. And same with, uh, I'm wearing the BHS Ultimate Frisbee hoodie. That team that I started with in 2017 has reached the state finals every single year since then um, with everyone who used to play with Peter on that field and just like people who just learned the game from someone who learned it from Peter. Same with the, like, it just means so much. Like uh, the women's team that uh, his daughter helped start won the won the championship last year, and they're undefeated this year, and they're gonna do it again. And I, very recently, and uh, I'll just end it with uh, over COVID summer when nothing was going on, Peter still wanted to find a way to uh, throw frisbees with some people, so he he, uh, he emailed me and asked me if I wanted to like run a camp with him so that we could just like teach these middle schoolers and future members of the varsity team at BHS. If they, um, so I remember I went to Callahan, we were just sanitizing discs over and over again and trying to figure out the, the best way we could socially distance while still playing Frisbee. And very recently I was reminded of that because I went to a BHS game and I recognized a ton of kids in, uh, playing on that field and I saw Peter in the stands many years after, well, a couple years after any of his kids were on that team. And it was just nice to know that he still just cares so much even though he doesn't have any, like, it's just nice to know that he cares and he shows up. And that's the thing I like about Peter. He will always show up. Hi, um, my name is Sadie Harris. I'm a senior at Burlington High School and I'm captain of the girls' ultimate Frisbee team. 
Um, I'm honored to say a few words about Peter um, and his impact on me and the Ultimate Frisbee community here. Um, since I started playing, Ultimate has been such an influential part of my life, and I have Peter to thank for that. He first got me and many of my teammates involved in Ultimate. I've never met someone more passionate and dedicated to growing the sport. He has been a true advocate, and thanks to him, the Burlington Ultimate program is as strong as it is. There are not many opportunities to start playing Ultimate before high school, but Peter made sure that I and many of my peers had the opportunity to start early. He was more than happy to spend his free time working with developing players in middle school. But Peter's influence goes far beyond sports. Ultimate is self-officiated, which places responsibility on the players to develop and display sportsmanship and fairness. Players must have the confidence to make calls and communicate with the other team. We must negotiate in good faith while clearly stating our case. Peter's dedication has instilled these lifelong skills and values into several generations of Ultimate players across Burlington. Last season, our team won both the state championship and the Spirit Award, which is voted on by other teams based on knowledge of the rules and sportsmanship. The success of Burlington Ultimate in both of these aspects is a testament of the values Peter has worked into the program. Ultimate has brought me so much. Starting a new sport was definitely out of my comfort zone, but I'm so grateful that I did. Ultimate has the best and most welcoming community of all the sports I've ever played, and I met some of the most amazing people. It has given me a chance to be a leader, and I want to thank Peter for that. Without him and his encouragement, I wouldn't have had the chance to be a part of this community. Peter's given so much to the sport and growing the community, and I can't think of a more deserving recipient. It's clear to see his passion for getting young players involved. By relentlessly advocating for Ultimate, Peter has helped so many players, including myself, find a welcoming community and a supportive environment. I'm so excited that he's being honored for all his hard work and so grateful he got me involved. Thank you. So I love the feeling at the end of this event, um, just hearing from all of the speakers uh, and seeing the, I don't know, I, sometimes I think the word heroes is overused, but it does leave me with a sense of just uh, folks that we have in our community that are such gifts to us. Um, I just have this sense of strength that, uh, that we can we can address some of these issues that have come up today, that we have the power and the support in this room to make that happen. Um, I do want to share just a few things before we wrap up. Um, one is that uh, hopefully you had a chance to take a look at our resource table, but we're doing a lot of great work in the community. Uh, we always love new volunteers, new people to connect with us and think about how you can use your gifts and talents to do some of that work for substance use prevention, whether it's as a board member or uh, supporting um, events like this um, or donating your time or your or even uh, financially donating there's lots of ways to use whatever gifts that you have um, we are very lucky to have um, someone who's gifted uh, an organization that gifts uh, their uh, financial resources, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, I just want to say a giant thank you to them for sponsoring this event. We're, we've been able to continue to offer it free of charge uh, to, for anyone who wants to participate, and we hope we can always continue to do that. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is um, really one of the reasons that we're able to do that every year, so I really thank them for their time. And for our board chair, Megan Peake, who uh, works in community relations and health promotion at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, she's here today. She is always a help in putting on this event, but also in supporting that connection to get that financial donation. So thank you, Megan, and thank you to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, <laughs> Um, and just a few other thank yous. Thank you to CCTV, who are in the back taping today. They are another amazing community resource. Um, we will make sure to send out the link. Uh, they are, I believe, live streaming, which I didn't realize was going to happen. Um, <laughs> and also, there will be a recording for later um, that if anyone, you know, had family that missed it who wanted to... Uh, 
who, to honor the awardees, we'll have that link for you to share with everyone. Um, and thank you to all of our board members who all are here today helping out. Um, we had a little bit of kind of some things shift this week and needed some extra help and they all showed up. Megan and Mitch and Mariel, we have all the M's uh, on our board, um, as well as Karen and Tien uh, who helped with planning and setting up for t tonight. And also Angela, and Delaney Halstead, who jumped in at the last second to help us volunteer and make everything come together. So thank you all for all of your help. And lastly, I have two amazing staff, Bianca and Evan, who, um, who are just like rock stars in making all this come together. Bianca was the one who uh, put together a lot of the details for this event, had something come up and couldn't be here tonight, and Evan just stepped in and tried to help me pull it all together. Really, I'm very lucky to have both of those um, folks on our team um, and make this a special uh, celebration, we hope. Um, so we love reading about the nomin or reading the nominations for the Roots of Prevention Awards. Honestly, there are a lot of unsung heroes in the community. I think we probably all know that. Um, I am often the one, I didn't get to be the one to call people this year and tell them that they were nominated or chosen for an award, but I cannot tell you the number of times I used to be the one that always called folks. I heard from folks, oh, I didn't think anyone noticed that I was doing that. Um, so I just wanna say thanks. First to our awardees, people noticed you. Um, we see you, we know that there are a lot of things that you're doing that folks saw in this room tonight and probably things that we don't see that you're doing and we thank you for all of it. Um, and second for everyone else, don't forget to tell the people that you notice and appreciate what they're doing. Um, sometimes I get really awkward about doing that, um, but we all, we all have to do it anyways. I have to get over it, we all have to get over it. People need to know that we see them, recognize their efforts, probably even more these days than we ever did before. Um, and if you see someone that's making a contribution to the health, safety, and wellness of the Burlington community, consider nominating them for a Roots of Prevention Award um, so we can come back again next year. Um, so back to that, uh, at the tables, I asked you to identify who had the closest birthday. That person gets to take our, the table centerpiece. So take it with you, <laughs> plant it. It is in a little planter if you would like and build your, plant your own roots for prevention. Um, and if there's two close birthdays, we have a few extras up here. <laughs> um, so I hope you, hope you learned a few new things today, maybe you made a new connection tonight. Um, community organizer Margaret Wheatley said that creative solutions come from new connections. So hopefully there's some new creative solutions in our community. I wish for all of you the energy and resources to continue making connections, having conversations that lead to more positive changes for our community. Substance use, as we've heard, probably heard here tonight, is impacting everyone in our community in some way. Um, how we change the way we think about that. We need to change the way we think about that so that it can become one of those issues like COVID where we wrapped our energy and our resources around preventing long-term consequences. Um, substance use prevention is not the crisis. It's a steady long-term investment in policies, practices, education, and supporting our community assets that prevents the constant need for a crisis response. So please keep planting those roots for prevention now to help our children and our community thrive in the coming future. Thank you for coming. Good night. Yes. So in following Mariah's lead on acknowledging people and what they do, I want to acknowledge Mariah for everything she does to lead this organization and make this happen. So thank you.